And now, your go-to source for year-round fantasy hockey advice, DFS, and betting coverage. This is NHL Fantasy on Ice, presented by Skip, the official food delivery app of the NHL. Remarkably, we've reached the final week of the 2023-24 NHL regular season. With that in mind, it's time to tie a bow on another fantasy season. Brought to you by our good friends over at Skip. This is NHL Fantasy on Ice. Surprises, disappointments, recap, much more coming your way. Nick Alberga, Pete Jensen, and Anna Deal with you. What's going on, Pete? What's up, man? Skip, the official food delivery app of the NHL. And yeah, Skip has been delivering for this podcast all season long. To, so big thanks to them, of course. And big congrats, Anna, to everybody who has taken home the league championship trophy in their particular leagues. Hopefully we played a part in that. Hopefully we did, but I have to admit, if you won your fantasy league this year, I am more impressed than I ever have been in the past because this is the craziest regular season I could ever remember, Nick. So many twists and turns uh, and certainly a lot of uh, out-of-the-box performances, players we didn't expect we're going to get to all that. We, we prompted uh, social media, right, Pete, for some surprises and disappointments. Disappointments, by the way, I call them bust, Pete Jensen. No, it's true. Let's start with the surprises here. And I've been really impressed this year. He's probably going to win the Vezina. Connor Hellebuck, the Jets, I didn't have them in the playoffs because of all that contract uncertainty. Of course, a big championship week for him. And Nick, it's always tough when you have your top guys playing late in the season. You don't know if they're going to get the usage that they've been getting all year. He delivered with a shutout the other day. He was the goalie of the week at the most important time of year. And you probably could have gotten him outside the top 50 on average in fantasy. Absolutely massive, as we stressed before on this podcast, if you're going to put together a fantasy league. There's no way you finish this late in the season. I've been <laughs> steadfast on that for 25 years now. You're seeing McDavid miss some games. Like that, you're still, right. Your blue chip players are missing games. You don't want to see that. On Hellebuck, he was a guy I identified in my drafts this year. I was going to go after him. Winnipeg's a team that's always been slept upon, and he has just produced so much value. And then I think my lasting memory in general with the crease, uh, including Hellebuck, it's so volatile where he was a guy not really on the periphery to be the top fantasy goalie of the season. Here we are, the final week of the season, breaking down just uh, he's going to win the Vezina Trophy. I think it's easier to see in retrospect now that the season is over how things turned out. But the other day, I was actually looking through all the goalies, deciding who I thought was the best, most consistent goalie in the NHL fantasy and reality. And I took a look at Hellebuck's numbers and I was like, why were we so shocked? Because this guy has pretty much logged a 9-2-0 save percentage very consistently. If less than that, it's still in the 9-1 area. And it's never been been below that and he's a workhorse starter we are seeing every other NHL team kind of shift to like the tandem system in terms of their net minders and maybe we're just sleeping on him and he finally proved us wrong but looking back I'm not surprised the way the season turned out for Hellebuck at all Nick and the great thing about Hellebuck go look at his Octobers they're dreadful this year was the same story I own him in a couple leagues I'm like my goodness is this guy going to make a save then the calendar changed to November he he was so steady and far and away the Vesna Trophy winner, Pete. I would throw to the discussion as well, Sergei Bobrovsky and Thatcher Demko, who, by the way, had a futures on to win the Vesna, gets hurt, and, and Hellbuck was just too good. Even if Demko stayed healthy, I don't think he was winning that award. But Thatcher Demko, to me, in general, we're going to talk a lot about Vancouver over the next 25 or so, but the Canucks were a great story. It started with Demko, Pete. Right. They're really the biggest surprise in the entire NHL, hands down. And the luster is worn off a little bit. Now we're all previewing the playoffs and saying, oh, you know, they might get upset in the first round if they play Nashville or Vegas. And that's a valid thought, Anna. But really, from the, from the jump, this was a fringe playoff team. If you were high on them coming into the year, they were an absolute lock to make the playoffs before anybody else. So give Tockett a lot of credit and certainly Demko when he was healthy. Yeah, and the Jack Adams hunt at the very least. But for me, you know, my predictions this year, guys, were like absolutely disastrous. And I think the one prediction I'm proud of from the preseason is that I had the Vancouver Canucks making the postseason. Nice. The one thing I'm a bit concerned about, and I want to get your guys' take on it as well, heading into playoff pools and such, Nick, is there's a lot of positives with Vancouver. And one of the negatives is Elias Lindholm for me. I think when he came over to Vancouver, everyone was expecting him to fit into the system quite well. And turn things around or at least keep it consistent to the way he was in Calgary and it just has not happened for him. It hasn't. That's a perfect tee up coming up later this week. We're going to have a playoff preview, a betting preview, everything you need getting set for the Stanley Cup playoffs. But on Lindholm, 
Pete, I think he's a sleeper. Um, I, I'm big on contract years, and if there's one way Elias Lindholm wants to finish this season, is strong to set him up for his new contract, probably with Boston. Who knows? Who knows mm-hmm. where he's going this summer? It ain't going to be Vancouver. But I think he wants to put himself in a position where he gets paid. But certainly, I think when you look at Vancouver in general, and a lot of teams are victim of this, they just try to do too, too much. Like, I think you look at that roster traded for, signed. Like, even they had Phil Kessel in the mix for a couple of weeks. Like, I, I do think chemistry is a big part of the equation and conversation. And, Pete, we look back at deals uh, around the deadline that did and didn't work. Uh, this one certainly hasn't to this part. But I still think he's a sleeper in playoff pools. No, it's true. And back to Vancouver and the rest of the core. I mean, nobody was really picking Quinn Hughes to win the Norris over Cal McCarr or really anybody else because you weren't even certain, Anna, if they were going to even make the playoffs. But he's kind of running away with that thing. Pedersen was their 100-point guy last year. This year it's JT Miller, one of the best category coverage assets every single year in fantasy. And then Brock Besser. Now, welcome to the show and your potential here. I mean, we were waiting on this for quite many years from Besser, and he's had a career year as well. Good to see. I think the highlight of this fantasy season, for me at least, the highlight of this Fantasy on Ice podcast for this year was remembering that Davy Satriano woke up in the wee hours of the night to pick up Brock (laughs) Besser. That was definitely the highlight for me. But another team that I think, and maybe I'm the only one here, Nick, you can chime in on this as well, that really stood out to me and I was a little bit worried because I thought maybe their playoff run last year was a bit of a fluke was the Florida Panthers and I think across the board consensus the guy who wins every fantasy MVP for everyone this year is Sam Reinhart this team do you really think they have staying power for the next couple of years because they barely made the postseason last year and now they look like a power horse this year yeah, without question, this has to be the biggest singular story of the fantasy season, how this guy goes from an ADP of 96.4 to a top 10 fantasy file, 55 tucks, contract year. It's been unbelievable for Sam Reinhardt. I think you look at Florida in general, Sergei Bobrovsky is probably a guy who's outperformed his ADP again this season. I thought he was great in the uh, Vesna conversation. I think he's going to be there at the end of the day. But I think, Pete, when you look at Sam Reinhardt, what a story he's been. Pete, before you go, I have to just chime in here. Anna is almost like Christopher Mad Dog Russo, a power horse. The team is a <laughs> is that not a horse. is that not a term? I think powerhouse is the term. I always get <laughs> these things wrong, you know, but I like the ones that I come up with better. I always say the smartest cookie in the jar, and I don't know if that's a saying either, it's, but <laughs> it's charm, Anna. So I appreciate it. I think the audience appreciates Great. it as well. Pete, go ahead, fire away. Right, two surprise 50-goal scorers between him and Zach Hyman. We'll get to our uh, near the end of the year standings in the Jersey Mike's NHL Fantasy on Ice YouTube draft. Uh, Excited for that. But nobody had Hyman or Sam Reinhardt in that draft. So we were all, we all liked those players and, you know, their fantasy staying power, but neither of them had ever seen a type of ceiling as they did this year, Nick. So you talk about draft steals. You talk about that Jersey Mike's draft. Um, I have five players uh, on my list. Only one was drafted in our league. We have um, Artemi Panarin, I think, is the draft steal. His ADP was 35.1. He's a top five fantasy player to wrap the season. (laughs) Jesper Bratt, 68.8, top 15. Reinhardt, as mentioned. Philip Forsberg was a monstrous story this season. ADP of 142.5, top 10 player, 47 goals. And Matthew Barzell, uh, 154.9 uh, category coverage, point per game. Barzell back. There was just so much value in fantasy drafts. I, I talked about it off the top, Pete, where it's like my lasting memory of the fantasy season will be how much value I picked up after the fact. You, but you talked about Saturano and the waiver wire. You know, some of the late picks that I made and guys that I picked up later on in the year, I think it produced so much value. And I remember back at the Jersey Mike's draft when I was talking with Leboff, I had the Islanders out. It looks like they're on the cusp here, probably going to get in as of record time. Uh, but I would have thought if they made it, like that Sorokin would have been the guy carrying them. He faced a ton of high danger shots, did pretty well. But it's actually been Varlamov, Anna, top five in the league in high danger save percentage this season and starting the bulk of the games for that team down the stretch. And then their fantasy MVPs this year have been not Sorokin. It's been, you know, Dobson as a top five, 10 defenseman and Barzell playing with Horvat for the entire year. Barzell playing the wing and having, a, you know, a shade of his rookie season from many moons ago. 
That's a team I think I'm never going to quite get the pulse on because the Islanders are just a new team every single month. They have these pieces that we know what their ceiling looks like and then all of a sudden they'll underperform, they'll overperform and that's a team I stay away from just because I don't know where it's going but it does look like they're making the postseason. Some good pickups there. I think the Varlamov conversation is really interesting for me because we mentioned off the top Connor Hellbuck's probably one of the only goalies that you can count on as a workhorse goalie anymore and I used to think Elias Sorokin was one of those guys as well but you're seeing now the NHL next season two in your fantasy leagues really shifting towards this tandem type of situation Nick I uh, I always start way too early in prepping for the next season I've already put together some bounce back candidates and Ilya Sorokin is on there there's a reason why they pay this guy this money if if Again, like the two New York teams are fascinating to me. Like, could you predict Varlamov and Jonathan Quick having the same type of years? There's no chance in hell. I, I think, obviously, Shesterkin's been unbelievable in the second half of the season. I think you look at the New York Islanders. I think it's going to be Sorokin moving forward with Patrick Waugh. Since we're on the conversation of Sorokin, some busts that I want to bring to mind, disappointments, as Pete Jensen calls them. Tate Thompson, uh, this is a guy I was scared to rank going into the season, and there's no question he has not been healthy for a long period of time. ADP of 14.4, round number 90 in terms of rank right now. I talk about Sorokin, ADP of 18, around 170. Jake Ottinger's and I, another guy I would throw into that conversation. Tim Stutzla and uh, Philip Gustafson, another couple of guys that I thought were big-time disappointments. Uh, who did you have, Pete? Well, yeah, I'll take some responsibility for Thompson and the Sabres this year. I thought that they should. I still think they should have made the playoffs. When you see teams like Detroit, middling team, even when they have Larkin healthy and the Capitals are still in it and the Penguins, or they were 10 points out at the deadline, they're still in it. They might make the playoffs and Buffalo's eliminated before any of those teams. Shame on Buffalo. Shame on the (laughs) Jersey Devils. I was so high on both of those young cores, but they just didn't bring it this year. For me, there are two names that stick out when we're talking about bus. And I think in the off season, we get a little bit too excited about guys moving to different locations. And we're like, you know what, this is the year they're going to turn it around. The big one, Pierre-Luc Dubois in Los Angeles, guys, like that is the number one one for me. Second, Connor Brown. And we have to take accountability on this podcast because we hyped up Connor Brown to no end, thinking that it was going to be like the second coming with him playing with Connor McDavid. It did not happen, Nick. Those are the two biggest busts in my eyes. Yeah, I think um, high atop the list for sure. I remember having that Drew N versus Brown conversation. I guess uh, great to say that one of the guys (laughs) we called in Drew N's had a really, really good year. I would be shocked if he doesn't sign an extension with Colorado. But yeah, Connor Brown, it's been tough sledding, been better the last little while. And Pierre-Luc Dubois is the guy I always fade in fantasy drafts right there with Pete's boy, Pat Laine. Can't get there anymore. You, you got to give me a couple years and then I'll draft you in fantasy hockey. But uh, that, that's always a compelling thing. I'll go back and look at our rankings and my rankings specifically from the preseason to now. And there's always some surprises. There's always guys you just don't play up to expectation. And, and those are the guys that came to mind, like Thompson again, Sorokin. The goaltenders are always atop the list, it seems to and who would have thought that if the Sabres were going to miss the playoffs yet again, the playoff droughts now at 13 and counting, hopefully they end it next year, but who knows? UPL over yeah. Devin Levi. Remember uh, Johnny Lazarus took, uh, I mean, he had a great draft. He's not going to win that league, but he did take Panarin, I believe, in that draft. You were saying it was yeah. one of the steals. He also had yeah. one of the worst picks in Devin Levi because he's been in the yeah. AHL for most of the season. And who could blame him for making that pick at the time? He looked like he was going to be a top three Calder guy. But really, you could say UPL, even with what has gone wrong with the Sabres, Anna, may be the biggest goalie steal in all of fantasy, either him or maybe Connor Ingram. One of those two, for sure. I think UPL at least became relevant again. I feel like everyone stopped talking about him because of Devin Levi in the preseason and it was his crease to take. And I feel like UPL finally, at least he's on people's minds at the very least heading into next year. There's a certain category, Nick, this year that I think hasn't existed in past years, just based off of how tumultuous this season has been. And those are like the bus that gave me hope at the end of the year. (laughs) And I feel like that has never happened before. But there's two players that stick out to me in this case, and that's Andre Kuzmenko who I was really, really high on heading into this season. And he didn't look too hot. Now with Calgary, he has nine goals, 16 points in his past nine games. He's rocking and rolling. And then Timo Meyer finally turned stuff on at the end of the year for the New Jersey Devils after being pretty much irrelevant under Lindy Ruff for most of the season. So wondering about those two guys, like, is it enough for you to be confident in them next season? 
Yeah, definitely. It makes me at the very least like second guess my original rankings going into next year that are always changing. But Kuzmenko specifically is a guy I picked up on and we did here on this podcast right away. I mean, this guy, the guy scored 40 goals. I mean, you don't, you don't just score 40 goals in the NHL. I understand he's a bit older, but he's a guy I'm circling back on. I still think he's going to be a sleeper. I think people are going to pass on him. I think a lot of people are not playing fantasy hockey this late in the season. If they're not playing fantasy, they're probably not watching. And I think he's a guy definitely, like, he feels and looks more comfortable uh, in Calgary if he stays there long term. Kuzmenko's a guy, I think he's going to be ranked around 100, 120, at least that's where I would rank him, all in on him. And Timo Meyer, like, it's weird. Like, I, I agree with you. He has not had a good year. I don't think his value has changed at all. He has been a top 50 guy going into the season. And Pete, I think he's going to be around the 50 mark going into next season. No, it's true. And when you look back at the the drafts that we did and stuff. And, you know, sometimes even some of the top guys, like you got to give them some respect. Kucherov, Pasternak, yeah. their teams were on a downward trajectory. And all of a sudden Kucherov explodes for even better than his previous career high. One of the best seasons in the NHL individually in the past 30 years for Kucherov. And Boston is right there near the top of the NHL standings. Thanks to Pasternak. He's not going to win the Hart Trophy but maybe he should be getting a little bit more love for that award. Yeah, I was just going to mention, too, again, if you guys recall, I, I wasn't feeling as great as others on David Pasternak, and he's exceeded my expectations. And that conversation was more about the centers. I, I read a stat last week on X uh, pretty much suggesting that uh, the turnover from Krejci and Bergeron has been pretty much the same in terms of what they have with Zaka and Coyle point-wise, w- which is nuts. I mean, those guys have really, really elevated – uh, you talk about Pavel Zaka. He was on our sleeper list. The first half wasn't great. The second half, fantasy playoffs, he was electric. So I, I got to give a shout out to David Pasternak. Want to do the same for Austin Matthews, first player to 66 goals in 28 years, one away from 70. As we have this conversation, he's been incredible. You, you mentioned Kucherov. You mentioned Nathan McKinnon. Anna, that's my lasting memory from this fantasy season. How many bona fide studs there were in fantasy hockey where you go into next year. It is no longer a foregone conclusion McDavid's one. It's no longer a conclusion that Leon Dreisettle's number two. Like the rankings next year are, are going to be nuts. I can't wait for that episode of this podcast. I do think McDavid is going to be number one next year. I'm not going to lie to you, but number two to number five is up for grabs. And I feel like everyone's rankings is going to have a different order of players because you're right. All of these guys have had phenomenal years breaking, whether it be personal records or NHL records. And another guy I wanted to give a shout out to as well, who's flying under the radar is Kirill Kaprizov, because earlier in this year, you could tell he wasn't 100% healthy. He also missed some time and he wasn't looking like himself, but he should have had a 100 point season if he played a whole 82 games he's still 11th in the NHL right now with 93 points in 73 games and that was a player I know a lot of folks who were listening were worried about but look at the way he's turned things around too so that's another name I wanted to throw out there Pete yeah I like that and you you wonder too guys like if if they could play with the right cap there in in Minnesota you sort of forget like 15 percent or 15 mil of that cap is getting paid off the guys who are no longer with the organization and the franchise I mean it is what it is but I think Kaprizov's a guy who has stapled himself as a bona fide, at least top 15 fantasy file year in and year out. He's only going to get stronger. I think there was a bit of regression this year, but in the second half, specifically the last 15, uh, he has been so strong. And again, like that's going to be a fun convo where you can make a case for 10 to 15 players next year, Pete, to be in your top five. Like it's nuts. It's true. And I think when I look back at like I had the fifth pick in that draft, I believe Kucherov was still there and I took Jack Hughes like I might have been up closer to you in the standings if I had the 150 points that Kucherov has or whatever it is. And Jack Hughes is better than a point per game. He's been dynamite when healthy, but he's missed a significant amount of time. So Kucherov has like double the points this season. Also looking at the uh, fan questions and comments delivered by Skip. Uh, Jason Robertson, people are saying, was a bit of a disappointment. Tage Thompson, a couple people said him. Trevor Zegras, I don't know if, what you were expecting, but uh, he has not been fantasy relevant this season and injured. Big surprise, Dobson, uh, Sam Reinhart, Brandon Hagel, also one of the best even strength point producers in the whole league this year for Tampa. Wanted to add, too, in terms of uh, waiver pickups, we talked about Davey Satriano picking up Brock Besser at like 3 a.m. in the morning after the first week. Well, he was 45% drafted. Other names I would throw out there, Seth Jarvis, 18% drafted. Robert Thomas, 7%. 
Wyatt Johnston, 4% drafted, so the majority of fantasy owners just plucking this guy off the waiver wire. UPL at 4%. And uh, Joey Decord, we talk about goaltenders getting claimed off waivers. I think he's in that conversation where he really boosted Ignited Fantasy rosters this season, Anna. He did. Pyotr Kachekov as well, if you yep. listen to me, guys. He turned things around. A tumultuous season for him. But the waiver wire is where I think a lot of people won their leagues. And you mentioned Robert Thomas, and I want to give a little bit extra emphasis there because no one's really talking about St. Louis. Like, I get that they're not making the postseason, but Robert Thomas was over a point-per-game player and is very much up there among the elites in the NHL right now. He has more points than Jason Robertson. He is right around the same area as Matt Kachuk. And even though Kachuk missed some time, I feel like Robert Thomas is a name that I've barely heard been mentioned. And I feel like St. Louis has something brewing. Like, they're always competitive. They're always around the edge. And the way he's been playing, that's a player I definitely am, like, certain circling a couple of times heading into my fantasy drafts next season, Pete. Actually, Jordan Bennington has been a yeah. pleasant surprise this year, even though they're going to miss the playoffs. Heavy workload around the top 10 in the league in wins, despite them missing the playoffs here. Uh, so maybe he's still got something left in the tank. And never know, with all the international competition, maybe he's in the mix for a Team Canada goalie. That's not exactly a good look uh, for that country in that position, but good for Bennington to rediscover his form from the championship year, at least. Already throwing shade at uh, Canada. You you will mess around and you will find out. Just wait for the uh, Four Nations and the Olympics coming up in a couple of years. Speaking of which, a guy who's going to be on the Canadian roster, presumably at the World Championship, Bobby Boy. Let's have that Connor Bedard conversation. We've been waiting all year. Coming out of the bullpen, producer Bob Bender had that number at 69 and a half. It got really, really damn close. <laughs> he had 60 points in 66 games here, so not too shabby, Bobby. Close, but no cigar, okay? It was all based on him not playing the full season, and he didn't play enough games to get there. And that's that's just reality when it comes to a young kid, his size, coming into the NHL. I hate to bank on an injury or, or him missing time, but that's exactly why the under, folks, was the play. And I will be – I think now me and Nick are even on pastrami sandwiches, so we it are. just sort of yeah. cancels out. Sure. I still haven't gotten mine from Anna and Pete. When, <laughs> again, when I get back to New York, I expect it, and I want it. Okay, guys? Yeah, you'll get your sandwich. I'll buy you the knish. Anna will, t- will take home the, the pastrami for you. But, I, yeah, it's going to be – a fun postseason, and I'm looking forward to the playoff pools and the betting show, of course, Bet365, Action Network collab. Any other surprises or disappointments? What about the rest of the rookies? Brock Faber, right? Stand up, take a bow. Um, some people are picking him for the Calder over Bedard. Who are these uh, people? I want to Because know. <laughs> of his workload and stuff, but he has had a really nice season out of nowhere. He was like on our week one pickups on the waiver wire. Remember that? Who are these people? That's a good question that Nick asked. I mean, I don't think anyone really is picking him over Bedard, but we saw this coming a little bit. I don't think anyone's too shocked with the season he's had. He has showcased that he's able to perform and has the opportunity to do so. And I'm I'm not surprised by this in the slightest. I just think there's way too big of a gap between Connor Bedard and everyone else this year, Nick. You know what's crazy is that Brock Faber could have been an L.A. King. I know you can do this with a lot, or he was an L.A. King, was traded in the Kevin Fiala deal right like it it, you never really think about the prospects when they were dealt but then he goes there I I think he's been great he's obviously going to overtake Spurgeon um uh, you know at some point Luke Hughes is another guy I would throw into that conversation I remember it was hot on Logan Cooley coming into the year he's had a really strong finish so have the Coyotes um but I I think like he's a guy I'm going to identify next year to go after but yeah like the rookie class was weird because we knew it was Bedard and like everyone else so I think Kochekov deserves some praise Brock Faber, a lot of other guys like Elevated who really weren't in the conversation to begin the season, Pete. And there were injuries too, key ones to Joseph Wall, Leo Carlson, Adam Fantilli. I'm excited to draft all three of those guys in fantasy next season. If they could stay healthy, they could all have that little breakout step in their young careers. Very promising fantasy assets for the years to come. Also wanted to give a shout out to Evan Bouchard. We mentioned him as one of the best keepers in the league, uh, top defenseman in the league in standard Yahoo categories. So yeah, I love Bouchard and what he's done with McDavid, especially under Chris Knobloch, right? I mean, that was a huge storyline of the early going. Okay. My biggest disappointment of the entire season, which I was 
absolutely correct on when everyone was talking about this guy preseason. I, I hate to even mention him on this program, but I have to. Is the biggest bust and disappointment of the entire year. His name is Eric Carlson. <laughs> Eric Carlson. Who? Okay. Yeah, exactly. What a bust. What a disappointment. We will not mention him next year, mm-hmm. I promise. Nick Alberga, Pete Jensen, Jersey Mike's fantasy draft standings who has them who wants to reveal them and then we have to wrap no i was just gonna say like i'm not this person i don't victory lap i called my shot when we did the draft in the studio and it wasn't close uh it ended two weeks into the fantasy season i won by like 20 points and i said it as as soon as i got right and i think third overall it was over but uh, my combo was like obviously I, I i stacked the colorado guys with mckinnon the season he had I had Roman Yossi in the conversation. I had Braden Point, Matthew Kachuk. It was just an all-star squad. That's a great job out of you, Nick. Now, who, yeah. Pete, run through the standings. I want to know who came in last because they have a debt to pay as well. <laughs> so there are still, as of record time, a couple of days for you know maybe some minor movement in the standings. Yeah. But here is how it is looking on April 15th, with just three or four days to go for most teams. Only Franz Nielsen, number one, by a landslide. Number two, Tage Master, myself, slightly ahead of Michael Leboff in number three. Then Johnny Lazarus, Lauren Jabara, Anna Dua, Arda Ocal at number seven. And then a decent gap before the last place finisher, <laughs> Steve Dangle. I think oh, you should, baby. Steve. I love Steve. I love what he does covering the Maple Leafs. I didn't like that fantasy team name, and he (laughs) finished last in the standings, so go get it. Hey, and give credit to Leboff, too. Everyone dogged that guy for the the team he put together, including Nick and Pete. Oh, my God, Leboff, what a terrible draft. He came in third, so uh, tip the cap to Leboff. He's going to be on here uh, later in the week as we do an entire betting preview, a little NHL action collab uh, with (laughs) our guy Michael Leboff, and maybe a special guest appearance from Tim Kalinowski. We'll see how I feel as the week winds down. All right, anything else? Any last words? Anna, anything from you? Last word from Anna, anything? I would just like to say I was unfairly targeted by the hockey gods in this draft because literally almost every single guy other than Nikita Kucherov was injured for a significant period of time on my team. That's it, guys. Yeah, I was going to say not to back you up, which I don't normally do, but uh, health uh, big with this league. You can't pick up players. So a lot of teams were buried early on with some of the injuries. So I wanted to give a shout out to Jersey Mike's fantastic time. Be back in, uh, in in September to do it again, right? I'm going to defend my title. we got to get me like a championship belt, and we'll bring it into studio, and we'll do it all over again coming up in September. Guys, great stuff. As mentioned, later on in the week, your playoff preview, uh, your betting preview, the Stanley Cup playoffs. Let's get after it less than a week away from getting going. Can't wait for that. Thank you to producer Bob Bender. Uh, many thanks to Pete Jensen and Anna Dua. I'm Nick Alberg. You've been listening to NHL Fantasy on Ice, delivered by Skip, the official food delivery app of the NHL.